Let's see. We're recording. I I posted today something which I'm going to talk today. I don't know if you received, you've had a chance to see on the email, basically that- uh, I did, I saw your emails. And I know you also uh, um, looked in Tanya too. So I really enjoyed, I'm almost, it's the second time I'm going through, the first time I did it several years ago, my wife was reading and I was listening and now I'm doing myself and I'm rediscovering a lot of interesting things. Sort of like meaning of life through that. Try to be not as, um, not to pay as much attention to a form, but more toward the substance and kind of try to find a balance. And Tanya, basically now I'm going through chapter 34, which compares essentially to two generations and I'm extending to three generations. The generation of our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were not Jews. They're like beginners of our faith, they're Hebrews, and eventually Jews will come out from that. But they are Torah presents a very close connection to God. And metaphorically speaking, they saw God, they heard God, they actually talked to God, just like you and I talking on Zoom. And today, has as Tanya promotes the idea of continuous connection to God, and Tanya says, if you find connection to God through uh, through Chokhmah, through the highest element of the Ten Sefirot, then essentially become one. That's the whole concept of non-duality of God. So you become, and you can, and Tanya says, you can achieve this uh, noble, elevated goal even more so than in the afterlife in the world to come. Because in the world to come, the soul is, figuratively speaking, sealing up with Hashem. It's still soul and God. It's very close in a full light. There's no filtering, but it's still, this is me and the boss. Watch close the connection. They're now buddies and friends and together, but it's still, but we, through so studying the Torah and doing mitzvot and prayers, can actually become integral part, the unity, even closer than that. So that is on that level, our forefathers, those Jacob, they're only 70 people when you think about it, roughly the ones who came to Egypt, 70 people, I might mean, argue 70, 150, but not a lot. And then this connection. Now, what did they do all day? I mean, Abraham goes to the field. He's working with a sheep and uh, farming and this and that. And all the time, he is available to continuously be in touch with God every 24 hours a day. The next generation, the next, next, uh, the times of Moses, Moses had that same elevated state, but the rest of the Jews, 3 million of them now, not 70 people, they, after the second commandment, say, oh, we can't handle it. We can't handle it. He gave us a break. And uh, Moses said, okay. Uh, God said, fine. Hi, Reuben. Hello. So God said, fine. I'm not going to give you a break. Uh, you can't handle it. In other words, you couldn't get to the level of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, I thought you guys could. And therefore, you don't even need the temple. I will be inside your souls like you innately be with me. Experience that. You don't need a temple to go to and pray. You do it all continuously. Oh, can handle it? Fine, I give you a temple. But right? if you have a temple, then you have to have all rituals and all the details and all the rules and then the whole Torah. You ask for it, you got it. So essentially, that generation of people in the desert, they didn't have, they did see some I mean, the column of smoke that God showed himself, but it didn't already didn't have those three million Jews, didn't have the same experience in Abraham, where he literally was kind of talking to God like you, me, and Reuben, Reuben and Baba talking. And then, and then their occupation during the day was more than Abraham. Abraham basically like living in Beersheba. He didn't watch TV. Didn't he go to basketball game? He gets up in the morning. What did he do? Now we are essentially, we're saying we don't have God. We don't see God at all. And of course, I think rabbis and we'll say, no, we're experiencing it. Essentially, we communicate. We go to the synagogue. We stay in prayer. We have the same connection. But it's kind of not the same as Abraham walks through the field or Jacob. And all of a sudden, he has this revelation. So, and also, if we try to get this connection, if I'm driving the car and I want to get my chokhmah to get me, I can say, okay, I'm going to an accident. So, and now it's 15 million Jews. So 73, now 15 million. And we're now not doing only what Abraham did. 
even if I'm a farmer, I go to the farm, but I go to basketball game and I play football and I uh, and I have a poker game with a friends. So a lot of things that Abraham probably didn't do. So the question then we are posing is, is our generation better or worse? Or and a Tanya's answer to that. I'm going to finish and then I'm going to open it for questions. And Tanya finishes, don't despair. Don't think that you're, you're because rabbis today will say we fell down from the old generation. The old generation could remember if you ask Abraham how many, or if you ask him rabbi 2,000 years ago, how many times the, the word uh, shulchan is in the Torah, he'll say it's uh, 57 times and this is where they were. And today we have to go to Google and even then we don't know how to do it. So much more developed in their minds. We are very now d diminished in our capacity, although we think, well, we're so much better. Five, five, five plus seven, I'm going to get a calculator, 12. Without a calculator, I can add five to seven. And then, but we have sciences, we have technology. Abraham didn't have airplanes. Uh, Jacob never had the mission landed on the moon. Technologically, they didn't have the same things. Well, they would say, well, we didn't need all this stuff. And who needs it? So there's a two ways to look at it. Did it become better? Did it became, I, I don't know better is, a lot, good, is the right word. Did it become more elevated, more spiritual or less? So Tanya said, if you would say we're not, Tanya has an answer. Tanya said, because I think rabbinical Judaism will just give it up and say, we're just not better. And just like, oh, who are poor us? But Tanya is saying, if you do a mitzvah, if you study Torah, then you can get yourself to the same level as they did. Even though they didn't, well, you don't experience God by physically talking to him, so to speak, one eye to eye. But in studying the Torah, you go to class, you're studying Torah, and you experience the same connection. And then Tanya said, that experience, even if you're only learning, let's say, for an hour a day, but it extends to the entire 24 hours. So somehow Tanya gets a conclusion that is the same thing equivalent to Abraham continuously thinking of God, even though he is now shearing the wool from this sheep. So that is why I was just going to mention and see what uh, you and uh, Ruben will think about that. You know, if you look at the whole swath of our history, which is 4,000 years, it is unbelievable how very, very few times God interacted with us um, even with Abraham, someone on such an elevated level, he had maybe three or four interactions. Most of them were very brief. Isaac had even less. And Jacob had a few extremely uh, spiritual interactions, such as seeing the famous ladder that went over Jerusalem. Yes, mm -hmm. But even, even after that, there's been very few interactions. The only significant one was actually... At Passover, that's the only significant interaction. And most of our, our our Jewish faith is just that. It's faith. It's based on a couple of times that God did choose to interact with us. And the fact that we're not seeing him now is not even that significantly different. And when you talk about the Navis, the, the, like when you talk about the, um, the prophets, the only prophet that really saw God with clarity was, was Moses. The other prophets only saw God in a very indistinct way mm -hmm. and never really had direct communication with them. It was a, a, a very subtle, even even uh, Jeremiah and all the rest of them, uh -huh. it was a very subtle interaction with God. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're necessarily on a lower level now than, than the Hebrews and the Jews were for the last 4,000 years. Um, most, most of our religion is on faith. The only dramatic interaction occurred over a period of what was it one year in Egypt and that was it besides that we had Abraham was visited very briefly maybe for a few minutes by three angels um there was a couple other dramatic uh dreams or interactions and besides that if you think about it that is the entire swath of Jewish interaction with God it's been very brief and very little and maybe you know why should the creator of the universe <laughs> have more interaction with us. And I don't think it's any excuse for a, lo a loss of faith today. It's a very eye-opening point. I would say there's point. been a lot more interaction. I would say there's been a lot more interaction than that. It's a many, many people have had 
uh, experiences with God. You're talking about God interacting with the entire Jewish nation? Yeah, that's that doesn't happen too often since the Exodus, but um, you know, many Rebbeim, many Kabbalists, the, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe and all the Rebbe's before him have had extraordinary mystical experiences, just uh, but I've why, had experiences myself. Ru so. Ruben, but why would rabbis often, I heard it from rabbis many times, and how, what's the English expression? Meager-minded or when your mind is weak? Mean, what's in English you say? Not meager. When somebody Weak-minded? Yeah, so we are so meek-minded comparing to the old generation. The impression I was getting is like, we're nothing. Like, we are standing in the shoulders of the giants. They were great. I mean, yeah. I mean, well, Ruben, really... tell me about tell me about the interaction since Torah that you that you consider to be legitimate interactions with God, even though all of us have had spiritual experiences, but something of note for our entire people. The foundation of state of Israel is uh, the is interaction Rebbe, with God. The Ulster Rebbe. Both of them. All of them. That's a good question. Ruben, what do you think? I can answer that. That's a good it's, question. How do you find interaction with God? What kind of interaction are you talking about? God, God communicates with you in some form. A legitimate form. Yeah. It's happened to many people. Many people have had... Uh, Experiences like that. Many people have had near death experiences. I had myself, I had an experience when I was 19, or quite extraordinary. God busted into my life and gave me some words to say to a woman who was uh, freaking out and calmed her down. The message was uh, accept from God humbly and you'll receive from him bountifully, which is kind of unusual. Felt like there was an energy coming through the top of my head where we're a kippah. And the problem was, at that point, I was a socialist and didn't believe in God. And uh, it's like, what? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, many people have that kind of experience. People have near-death experiences of experiencing, you know, the experience of spiritual well, being God. That's interesting. You were socialist, but you didn't think that Karl Marx was talking to you. No, but when I became religious... It upset my mother, who's a hardline Marxist. She thought she actually said, "I don't know where we're at." Well, <laughs> you have an interesting sort of like, sort of like a reversal of the uh, you know the son who becomes a Marxist and uh, gives up the religion. You know, where did we go wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let, let let me step back for a second, guys. It's interesting. Like what you sometimes interesting, Bob and Ruin just gave a specific example. I started off, you missed a little bit of the beginning, Ruben, that Tanya, I was talking about, you know, the book, Tanya, I'm going to 34 chapter now. Tanya basically connects two things. What you and I are talking about, it's more simplified web interaction. In other words, did Abraham physically, like, did he have an image of something, a burning bush that Moses were looking at, which would and how do we perceive it today? And then Ruben said, yeah, some people have these this experiences as well, even today. But Tanya is looking from different perspective. He's not looking for physicality of spirituality lining up with a, with a, with a, with a, this world. Tanya is saying that you can achieve the union with God, the uh, non-duality of God that most people don't achieve if you don't try. And Tanya gives you several methods how to do that. If you line up your chokhmah, the highest of a ten spirit, if you line it up with a Ein Sof, and you'll be able to do it, and the Tanya acknowledges it's not easy to do, but if you line it with God continuously, 24 hours a day, then you experience God as one. You are one. You're not close to God, but you are with God. You are God. You are one, well, the entire one. They say when you study Torah, you're one with God. But uh, that's what Tanya's saying. By studying Torah today, to experience it's, it, you know, it's it's one thing to just say you are one with God. You know, enjoy the experience, but to actually experience it, to feel it, is another thing. It's not. It's another thing. Right. Tanya is very very careful to 
to describe the two levels of fear of God. One is awe and one is fear. Uh, there, is, there is a genuine connection. This is Tanya talk, actually. There's a genuine connection to God. And then there are those who don't really have it in their heart, but you can make an intellectual connection to God. And this leads me to what you just said, Lev, that I don't look at Tanya that way. We cannot achieve the Ein Sof. We cannot reach the ultimate Chachma. That's impossible. And all of our souls originate on different levels. Like my soul might uh, uh, originate from the world of Asaya, and yours might originate from the world of Atsilut, which is the highest level. But the thing is, we should accept who we are, try to be a little bit better, and on any level that we can connect with God, that's acceptable. And in fact, the very first line in Tanya is, it's, it's very near to you. In other words, it's near to you on your level, and you shouldn't be jealous of others or expect more than you can achieve. But on whatever level you can achieve a connection to God, that's good. I, I, I see that as the, the, the uh, message of Tanya. Tanya said that, yeah. but but Tanya does say, I unfortunately I can't put my I just read the other day, I can't just easily find the page. Tanya specifically says that as Ruben says, when you're studying Torah nowadays and you apply your faculties of thought, speech, and action, which is a secondary thing, the your chokhmah, your pre-thought, the feeling, the emotional thing, that's a communication of God. That's how you connect with God. Tanya says no. Uh, yeah, everybody has different capabilities, and as long as you are, uh, uh, as long as you're happy achieving it in whatever level you are, it's fine. One is no better than another. But Tanya says you can achieve entire unity, non-duality, by physically going. That's what Tanya says. I wish I could find the page, but I can't just. It, it says black and white in Tanya. We might agree with with Tanya or not agree, but Tanya says if you study in Torah today and do mitzvot. You really become one with God. You are not close to God, but you are physically one. The entire universe is a hut. And Tanya explains, and Tanya is very careful to say that if you believe in non-duality, it's okay, but it's a little bit anti-Judaism. Tanya says, if you believe you can close to God, that means you're implying there is a God that is me. And the closer I get, the more the spring connects. It doesn't let you get much closer. And if you satisfy with level, Tanya says, that's okay. But Tanya says, that's still duality. But if you go Torah and Mitzvah, then you're not connect, you're not close to God, but you are one with God. Everything that I am right now, everything what we're saying, everything in the world, universe, that is one God. And that, what Tanya said, doesn't make him different. He was like this today. He was like that yesterday. She was at least for infinity. And that's how he will be. He is non-changing. That's how Tanya explained non-changing of God if we believe in non-duality. So oh, Tanya said, if you get yeah. too close to God, you become battle. You become non-existent in the glare of God. And once you're one with God, you cease to exist. But as long as we see ourselves as existing, we're still we're still trying to move up that ladder of simsum. Now that's a miracle. The fact we even exist is a miracle since everything is one with God. Our goal is to try and rise up that ladder. It's it shall shell it. It's it's a ladder through the worlds to God. But you know, we're not going to reach that level. Um, when we well, study, no, yeah. try well, to, but uh, Tanya, what you said, Tanya, to my understanding, in my limited understanding, Tanya said that. But Tanya and said that's usually for most people, for Benoni, for in betweener, it's usually in which we all are. It's usually the case, and you try the best, and if you can't get any higher, don't be upset. Be happy. Be joyful with your life. Don't think that this guy is so much closer than I can. Don't worry about it. But Tanya does have the fundamentally, it's possible. Maybe not for everybody. To achieve unity with God, and it doesn't mean you're a bit You don't get, you are one with God, and you still, at the same time, maintain your physicality. You don't become a bit It's a concept that's very difficult to understand, how you can be, become one, and yet still be living here and not be burned by the light of God. Ruben, when, it's possible. Ruben, when you left uh, socialism and started on your ladder to becoming religious, how did your relationship to God change over the years? Um, well, first it was like trying to figure out who is this guy. Um, I think I was a little bit paranoid. Like if he's that powerful, he could just squash me like a bug. Um, 
But then it went through a period of really feeling his presence. And then it went through a period, a long period, of very great difficulties. The feeling like they may enjoy tormenting me or he hates me. Um, and uh, I finally concluded that you ever read a, a book by Arya Kaplan, a short book, The Pure God? He discusses why God doesn't reveal himself to people. And he said, basically, that God reveals himself too much. It doesn't actually help people. It just freaks them out, makes them feel control. And the usual reaction is rebellion. Uh, he said, anytime a higher culture meets, like a lower, more primitive culture, the first reaction is depression, feeling overwhelmed. And the next reaction is uh, go on the war path, rebel or make a golden calf. The last level is to integrate to the higher level culture. I think I'm just getting to the point of finally integrating. I realize like one of the issues I'm struggling is why do we go through so much suffering? And I think actually the closer you get to God, the more suffering you have to go through because first you have to re be refined. Once God gets a hold of you, it's like you can't just settle for mediocrity and just blot it up. I'll go along and have a nice life and have my retirement fund and my vacations. And also God, you know, God has become kind of central. He's central. It has a tendency to wipe out your free will. You just feel like you're being observed and checked, you know, every move. Uh, but the suffering actually creates a kind of a you know, barrier and separation, which allows you space to grow and be your own individual without that feeling, you know, of um, obsessing about being watched all the time. Uh, it's a hard thing to explain. It's um, one of the uh, one of the Christian uh, theologian, um, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He said we should uh, judge people less on the basis of what they do, and more on the basis of what they suffer. Very interesting statement. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, statement. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you, that statement? What it means is that, <laughs> um, in a way, I think actually uh, sometimes suffering and difficulty can, in a way, bring us closer to God. I mean, it could <laughs> make, make us bitter, but it also can uh, peel away some of the things, the arrogance, the pride and the superficialities in us that actually get in the way of uh, getting closer to God. It can uh, help bring us to a state of more of humility. And like it says in Tanya, the more you can bundle yourself, the more you can become um, less filled up with yourself, the more closer you can get to God. You know, God says, uh, me and the arrogant person can't live in the same place together. It's like uh, humility is an essential quality if you want to get close to God. And uh, suffering can, suffering, it's, um, uh, if you have a thick crust around your head, suffering can burn that away. Uh, it's interesting, the book called Iron John, by Robert Wise, a poet, they wrote about the male emotional development. He said he's mostly ignored, ignored in modern society. He describes that primitive culture is like one African culture, part of the initiation into adulthood for uh, adolescent boys. We'll take them out the forest, tell them stories about the, the ancients and the uh, forces of nature. Then they'll knock out one of their teeth and then tell a story about how that uh, wound in the body is a becomes a portal through which spiritual divine energy can enter you. Um, it's a very interesting idea, the idea of a wound in the body uh, being an opening which allows uh, spiritual light to enter. It's, uh, it's paradoxical in a way, but I understand that. I, I, I see that. It's, um, you know, we always want results. And uh, 
we tend mostly in society to start judging. Well, he does this, he does that. He became rich, he invented something. These are fancy people. He's a big movie star or a musician. These are the important people. But Bonhoeffer, I think what he's saying is that um, no, the really great people, those who can suffer and grow through it, it will bring you closer to a higher spiritual level. And, uh, you know, it's, um, that's a mystery. You know, he's looking not at the physical world, physicality, he's looking at the ruchnius, the spirituality, and the, the spiritual world. Suffering becomes like a portal through which the divine life can enter. And uh, that's what should impress us more than what people uh, read. That's, it's hard to express it, but that's like the closest thing to bring. When I, when I think of the uh, Klosenberg Rebbe, and I treated his community <laughs> when I was a dentist, and here's, here's someone who lost all his family and almost his entire community in Auschwitz. The Holocaust, yeah. The Klosenberg Rebbe. And, and was he in Auschwitz? Yeah. And he lost his wife, his children, and most of his community. And, well, I don't know, Birkenau, but I think it was Auschwitz Birkenau. Yeah. But uh, he rebuilt his community. He married again. He had many children. He built a hospital in Israel. His community is thriving now in, in North Jersey and in Israel. And to, to this day, all I can say to myself is, I wish I could be like him. I don't understand how he did it. I don't understand how people handle suffering as you were just describing and become better for it. You know, we we all have traumas in our life and, and losses and, you know, getting beyond and getting closer to God is not so easy. It's it's a real challenge. Yeah, it's, um, I think if you go through great suffering, especially like somebody went through the Holocaust, to not become bitter or hate God I think you have to reach a different level inside. And it's uh, it's a real challenge. Not everybody can do it. And uh, you see, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, be little or think less of people who can't do it. It's just so hard. I mean, you know, I read the Tanya, but honestly, you know, I mean, all these people say, oh, it's a great guide to life. And if you follow it, it gives you all the answers. And I haven't experienced that. There are interesting ideas. I've thought about them. About like this whole concept that uh, we're totally united with God when we sit at Torah. Well, if that's the case, we're totally united with God when we walk down the street. <laughs> it's well, that's, that's God's what creating the universe. I, I... I think and every second it's clear that not everyone can do this. I, I think there's different you can reach God, but on your level. I, I think Tanya's clear about that. You know, yeah, but not he also says it's very near to you in your mouth, and then you know, blah blah blah. But yeah. you know, I tell you the other day I was in the shul and I tried this experiment. I'm 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 recording Tanya now after I'm reading, I'm learning myself actually. And I tried this experiment. I was I, I wouldn't follow the standard format of physics, Zimra and Shema, Amida. I just I I I jump into Shema and Amida, but in between, I most of the time I just stood and I look in the ark, and I was trying to apply this concept of uh, in a simple level, not sophisticated, but just to say, listen, I'm just imagining as if I am merging with God on a Chokhmah level. And then can I get to the point that actually I can, I, that my shoulder will stop hurting? And after I came out from the shul, I, my, my pain in the shoulder disappeared. And I, of course, think myself, well, that just psychosomatic, that's like, any psychologist will say you can hypnotize it. To the, uh, there's no divine thing. But I actually connected when I thought, can, can my shoulder help? <laughs> and it worked. And I was even thinking, should I even mention it to my wife and anybody because, you know, I'm a little superstitious, you know. You'll say, I, I wonder if you guys had similar experiences. You experience something like that. You tell somebody, and then three days later, your shoulder hurts again. And the guy said, Oh, see, yeah, it was just, it didn't hurt for two days. Now it's hurting again. You know? Or somebody like your dentist, Bob, somebody can say, I thought about it, and my root canal will get healed without going to the dentist. And then two weeks I've later, had, he, he yeah. rushed, you had to pull the tooth out. I've had several near death experiences, and I'm still here, and I've had enough of them 
Ruvain, I think you were saying the same thing that at this point, I'm just saying, like recently, my uh, a couple months ago, my fireplace blew up and it should have killed me, but I'm still here. Um, I just think Hashem is real and has plans for us. We, we are not really living an independent life. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um... Tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to try another experiment, guys. Tomorrow morning, I doing my, my five, 10 minutes recording. I make it a concept. I would say, because interest, I also learning from time. And I, I share what you're saying, Ruben, that you have to take it with grain of salt. I, I try to get a balance, but I'm trying to, I try to apply this concept that um, if you, you sort of like you try to make an effort, but you don't have to make it too much because Torah doesn't, doesn't, Torah, God doesn't, I don't think it once makes us a superhuman to get to such a high level to try so hard. The twin is, don't bang your hand against the wall. Maybe there's a door. So I was, I was trying this concept, Tanya saying, and that's actually runs very similar to monks, you know, like uh, medieval monks would put chains on themselves and they beat themselves and they bleed. Of course, it was very, our Judaism very much against that. But Tanya's saying is, and maybe like women, your wife is a psychologist, maybe she will attest to that. That Tanya says, no, you have to have a, you have to, you find yourself that you're nothing, you're miserable, but not the way the monks did, that you're know, just nothing. You know, but you really say how horrible that, like uh, in uh, 18th century, 19th centuries, 18th centuries, the, uh, uh, our, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, spirit, spiritual movement was saying that if you have the sessions, they'll sit on the floor and they say, I'm nothing, I'm miserable, go for hours like this, like this, like this. And we now, modern days, even modern Judaism, Rabbi Ingrid said, it's ridiculous. That's not what we do. That's monks do, Christians do it, not, uh, you know, in a monastery, it's not us. But Tanya says, you have to do it, not physically beat yourself, but come to realization how horrible I was not to treat my mother well, how horrible I didn't call my brother, how horrible it's, it's my fault. And you, you you have to reach. I think psychiatrists say you have to reach to the bottom of it. If you reach to the bottom, misery, you're crying, you're miserable, you're really in that mood. But you have to do it only for a certain time. You have this session once a month, a Tuesday for 7 p.m. to 8 a.m. or Wednesday, this is your time. And once you become miserable, you have to the bottom of it, you cry, you, you, you lost two pounds of water because it all tears walk, walk out. And then you walk out of there and you assume, you're not assume, but you're saying, I am forgiven. And from then on, you live your life, entire life, happy and joyful and okay. And then a month later, you have another session like that. So you have to get it, but not make yourself miserable continuously, every second. And maybe our, if you're doing Tachnun, we're doing every day, twice a day, not for an hour, but let's say for three minutes, also a miniature of that. So when you let you, and I tried it, I'm gonna try tomorrow again to do this, and I'm going to record myself, and I see how I feel. I think through the tears, through relief, it has even physiological uh, benefit. You come out, say, "Hey, I look great. How was it? It was so horrible, but yeah, I'm great now." You, 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 you unload it. That's what people go to psychiatrists and think sometimes to do exactly that. You can do it with God as your psychiatrist. You know, every seven days we're reminded we're supposed to be joyous. It's called Shabbos. No, yeah, that's supposed to be Joyce. Tanya says seven days, only a short time. Maybe, like I said, once a month for, for an hour. You must be, but you must be not sad, but really get yourself to the mud. How can I do it? It's all my fault. It's called uh, which they say we should do every night when we do Kriyachma. That review the day and think, oh, no, what did I do that, that's good, that worked? What did I do that wasn't good, didn't work? But it's not, quite, it's not quite. It's not quite criticized. It's not quite to really, really crucifying yourself, your soul for horrible, horrible things. It's, it's not like that. You take night shema, you go to sleep, you forgive people who you think you you, you fell in. They, I'm talking about really, literally, be, feel miserable. Want to feel miserable. And then Tanya said because this is how you understand how your body. It's all your body's things. That's what you do. Your soul sort of cleanses. It sort of gets relieved from your bodily problems. You separate your divine soul from the, from the animal soul. And then after you do it, it's your, your divine soul comes up and your body miserably dies, goes to the grave. 
And when it's done an hour later, soul comes back, reunites his body, now clean. It's like a complete but, run to the soul. I, I, I think this is going to take a lot of discussion, but I don't see Judaism in, in those terms. You know, every day we dive in, we say, Salah Lanu, in Shmon Esrei, we are forgiven. Um, we have Yom Kippur. I, I think that Jews are not supposed to have such highs and lows. I think we're supposed to live. What I, I'm just, I'm just relating what Tanya says. I don't know if I agree or no, not, but I, that's, that's, yeah, that's how the author Rebbe talks about setting aside a time to totally despise your nefesh of Bahamas and despise. And what do they say? It's like if a uh, if a log won't catch fire, so chop it up in little pieces of you. Chop it yeah. up with an axe, yeah. the little yes, slivers, that's right. That's can, right. That's catch exactly. fire. Yes, so I the idea is that chopping yourself up a little bit, only for specific times, yes, to regret your sins and uh, confess them, and then uh, it's like that can lead to happiness and. Uh, I like I said, depression. I said, Ruben, I always thought in the past. Well, Lev, you can try it. Let me know how it works. I'll try it tomorrow. Yeah. I, I, I'll, I always thought it's like crazy. That's not Judaism. This is like Christianity, like monasteries. And only now, when I do it, I realize that it actually has a lot of point. I then I know I couldn't yeah. understand it before. No, well, I, the Rebbe, the bunch. I understand, yeah. I understand the level of the altar Rebbe, but I don't agree with everything he says necessarily. Yeah, the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe said that in previous generations, people used to do a lot more fasting and self-flagellation. He said, this is a weak generation where Ikhvist and Mashika, and we just don't have that kind of strength. And he, he, he told people not to fast more than the minimum required by the Rebbeim. That's pretty <laughs> much it. We just need, that's why Sitsis don't have a blue, and blue represents Kabura. Uh -huh. They're white because white is Chassid. He said, this generation can only function in Chassid. Anyway, we're almost out of time. We're almost out of time, guys. Great discussion. We'll cover all the all the Thank dates. You. Next time, any topic you have to do it, it's uh, Tuesday, 8 o'clock Israel time, 1 o'clock American time. In the meantime, guys, I see you next Tuesday. Ruben, hope to see you early. Are you, are you for coffee tomorrow? Nice seeing you do? guys. Nice yeah, maybe tomorrow. You. Let me, All right, uh, call you tomorrow about 10. Guys, have a great week. Shabbat shalom. Love you. Talk soon. Shabbat shalom.